each of you. Spelman College is proud to host this panel discussion as a part of the Atlanta Nina Simone experience. She is a singer, songwriter, and performer whose ability to transcend genres echoes the tradition of her mother, musical icon and pioneer Nina Simone. Blessed with a rich vocal range and innate skill for lyrical interpretation and soul deep understanding of music as a means of healing, empowerment, and celebration, Ms. Kelly is very much her mother's daughter and is most assuredly a multi-talented artist in her own right. Our second panelist is Ms. Deanna Brown Thomas, who is a radio and TV personality, actress, humanitarian, and daughter of Mr. James Brown, the godfather of soul. Our third panelist is Ms. Ruby Nell Sales. Ms. Sales is a deeply committed social activist, scholar, administrator, manager, and educator in the areas of civil, gender, and human rights. She has spoken around the country on race, class, gender, and reconciliation, and she has done groundbreaking work on community and nonviolence formation. Being Nina Simone's daughter, well, whew, where to start? Many people have asked me what it's like, or what it was like, and uh, living with a larger than life personality in the house. For me, since uh, the day I was born, I was Nina Simone's daughter, so it really wasn't a big deal because that's just what I was born into. I find that when I go to various places, because my mother has affected so many people's lives in so many various ways, whether that's through the civil rights movement, whether that's through uh, other political activism, her music, her message, or any encounters that one might have had with her. I mean, women, I have found that in my travels that many people just have so many things to say to me with regards to how she has healed them if they were going through a rough time. Even President Clinton, I found out when he was having a hard time making a decision, he would lock himself in one of his rooms and play my mother's music and then he would come out and have made a decision that he was happy with. Kind of makes me feel good. Um, my mother's music has helped to heal many who've had car accidents, family problems, emotional issues, issues with their kids, issues in their society. My mother's music has helped many people myself having been born on the other side of the railroad tracks in 1933 and having uh, become a child prodigy at the age of three and graduating valedictorian, skipping two grades, practicing eight to 12 hours a day, which I'm like, okay, how many hours in a day? But apparently she did that because she, when she played piano, it was perfection. Um, I don't know if I could have done that. And when my mom passed away on April 21st, 2003, and I stepped into her shoes, um, ever since then, coming up on seven years, I'm getting a huge dose in what it was like to walk in her shoes. No, I'm not a civil rights activist. No, I'm not marching. No, I'm not speaking out or singing about the same things that she did. But as they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I'm very proud to stand here as Nina Simone's daughter. Proud to have her blood run through my veins. And I make no apologies to whites, blacks, or otherwise, for anything my mother said or did, but there was a reason for it. Whether it was personal, uh, whether it was her own personal demons that she had to deal with and never overcame, such as being born in North Carolina being told that her skin was too dark, her nose was too big, her lips were too thick, that she was ugly, and then becoming a woman and leading so many in fashion. How does that happen? if those things are really true. But these are some of the things that my mother dealt with on a daily basis, even though when she was on stage, one would never know. How many people here saw her perform? Oh my goodness, yes, yes. I am so glad and so happy, so elated to be part of the Nina Simone experience. Um, Anthony Page, who has uh, picked up a, uh, a heavy bag and uh, is carrying and working very hard with Lisa. Uh, on this Nina Simone experience, and I congratulate uh, Anthony. Asked me to come and be a part of this and wanted me to meet with Lisa. And Ms. Sales asked, did you all just meet? Uh, well, we just met Friday. There's something how kindred spirits 
you know, you can tell, you can just feel. We've known each other a long time. <laughs> Her mother was born the same year my father was born, in 1933. One thing I can say is that Miss Simone, along with her father and, and those kind of legendary artists, they had messages in their music, strong messages in their music. And the messages that were in their music still hold strong and firm today and still mean something today. But I will say hello, everybody. <laughs> First of all, I'm so happy to be here with you to celebrate an activist singer who meant so much to my generation. I can't tell you how many times I played Young, Gifted, and Black. I can't tell you how many times I played Now That the King of Nonviolence is Dead. These were songs that not only belonged to Nina Simone, but they represented the consciousness of a nation that was on the move towards freedom. And that culture taught you how to navigate and have values in a dominating white supremacist culture without becoming broken winged birds. There's, some, there's a thread, and one is the exploitation of their talent. The other one is, I read somewhere when Nina Simone said that if she had her way, she would be called a folk singer. That, that there was this notion to categorize black women or black people within certain genres like black jazz and blues, even if you were not doing that. <laughs> and, and, you, and so you were limited and restricted. Nancy Hughes, James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry was my godmother. I was present and accounted for when my mother wrote to be young, gifted, and black. She, uh, I was 11 years old. She looked at me and said, you need to know who you are and where you come from. She was hoping that that song would one day take the place of lift every voice and sing. Malcolm X, Betty Shabazz were my godparents. I was raised with the Malcolm X daughters. And there were so many figures, Bob Olatunji. At the time, none of them chose to be revolutionaries. None of them chose or knew that their destiny, excuse me, would include civil rights. They were motivated to jump in with both feet because of their own experiences, because of the social political environment at the time. Her goal was to be a classical pianist, ladies and gentlemen, period. And from the time that her gifts were recognized at the age of three, she was pushed to practice, to perfect, and to become one with the piano so that she could go to the illustrious Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. By the time she had graduated valedictorian from the Allen School for Girls and applied to the Curtis Institute and auditioned, she was rejected. Not because of her lack of talent, but because of the color of her skin. Well, she believed that there was a certain respect that all artists should have, that she demanded no matter where she was. So no matter where she played, she expected all of her audience to be silent, and to pay respect, and to pay attention. Don't get up and go to the bathroom, because she called call you out. <laughs> Ms. Nina Simone was a quintessential race woman. She really had the interest of the race at heart. And she belonged to a tradition of black women that went all the way back to the 19th century who were race women. So we call them activists today because we say that race is dead. So we don't talk about race women, but, but really um, black women in the 21st century have lost our grounding, lost our legs. Because how do you do your work as a race woman to, uh, to provide the backups that younger people need and the race needs in order to advance itself, in order to preserve our rights and to educate our youth when people tell you that, that race doesn't exist and the problems that your young people are having, they come, the core issues is systemic racism. So black women have not figured out a way since the last race women we had were in the 60s, and once integration came, there was no more race women. As many of her colleagues were either assassinated, left the country, or just lost their steam, 
my mother felt as if she was one of the last Mohicans with regards to uh, what they were standing up for at the time. And she felt that integration, quote unquote, was just a term, you know, that was not necessarily being applied. It was theoretical, more theoretical than it was actual reality. I mean, even now, if we think about it, you know, there are certain things that are still taking place within our country. It just has a different name, mm -hmm. it just has a different uh, color, mm -hmm. but it's still the same result.